Welcome to the Green Left Report, media for the 99%. I'm Mel Barnes. And I'm Simon Butler. This show, we'll talk about the struggle for women's equality with Sydney feminist activist Tessa Barrett. And we'll speak to Pip Hinman, who recently returned from Venezuela, about the significance of the re-election of Socialist President Hugo Chavez. But first, some activist news. Protests took place around the country during the Lock the Gate Alliance's National Week of Action against coal and coal seam gas over October 13 to October 21. Thousands protested in Mwilambar in northern New South Wales, and 3,000 people in Wollongong spelt out Protect H2O, Stop CSG. The small community of Natai, west of Sydney, declared itself a CSG-free town, and in St Peter's, Sydney, a human sign protest also spelled out their opposition to CSG mining. More than 3,000 people spelled out their concerns with a human sign at Bullice Showground, calling for the state government to legislate against drilling in water catchment areas. Demonstrations took place in dozens of cities worldwide on October 13 as part of the international global noise process against injustice and inequality. Hundreds joined the Melbourne event to make some noise of their own. At another Global Noise event in Perth, Socialist Alliance Fremantle City Councillor Sam Wainwright said addressing inequality will require serious wealth redistribution. We need to put on the agenda the fact that the wealth generated in Western Australia, particularly our mining wealth, belongs to all of us. And that mining wealth needs to be progressively placed under democratic public ownership. And that's also something that's, that's almost sacrilegious to say in a, in a state like Western Australia. But when you see the fantastic wealth of Twiggy Forrest, Gina Reinhart, Clive Palmer and all the rest of them, I'm reminded of the old squat, the old squatocracy of 150 years ago. And aren't these mining magnates of today just the same? The wealth doesn't belong to them, it belongs to us. About 3,000 people took to Melbourne's Sydney Road in Brunswick on October 20 for the Reclaim the Night protest to stop violence against women. The event followed a 30,000 person strong march that took place there earlier this month after the rape and murder of Melbourne woman Jill Ma. Protest organisers say this year's Reclaim the Night was the biggest march for more than a decade. And we're not just reclaiming the night, we're also going to reclaim our right as women to fully participate in this society without the fear of violence. I would also like to honour all our sisters who've been injured and who have been murdered in this century-long war on our agenda. And I'm talking here about the women in Iraq and Afghanistan. I'm talking about the Tamil women in Sri Lanka. I'm talking about our Aboriginal sisters. I'm talking about the refugees that are locked up. I'm talking about you, our mothers, our sisters, our daughters. I'm talking about all of us. I'm extremely heartened to see so many men here in the audience. We need you to teach other men And you should know, by cutting the sole parents' pension of 100,000 people, of which the majority are women, you're exposing them to more violence. And that is not feminist. Because of this, the struggle must continue. But it is the mobilisation of the feminist movement that will bring us change. The resistance will survive alive with a definite function. A public debate about sexism erupted when Prime Minister Julia Gillard attacked opposition leader Tony Abbott in Parliament for his misogynist attitudes. 
It was a reminder that even after all the advances in the past 40 years, women still face high rates of domestic violence and sexual assault. They shoulder the burden of childcare and housework. In the workforce, they make up most of the casual and underpaid workers, while earning 70% of what men earn. And they battle daily with sexism in culture and relationships. We're joined now by Tessa Barrett, who is a feminist activist based in Sydney. Welcome, Tessa. Thank, Thank you, you for being here. So firstly, we wanted to ask you about the, there seems to be a new resurgence in feminist organising. Last year, there were uh, the first slut walks were held. Uh, this year in Melbourne, we just had a fantastic Reclaim the Night um, protest march, 5,000 people, the largest it's been in a long time. In your opinion, is there a resurgence in feminist organising? I absolutely believe there is, yeah. and I don't think that it's any coincidence that with the rise of the right wing in America and all the debates over women's bodies that some of that spilled over here to Australia. And recently we had a uh, pro-lifer who shut down over 20 abortion clinics in the States come to Australia to talk. And people are now talking about issues that many people thought were long gone. Can I ask you about Julie Gillard's speech, which went viral, went all around the world, and, and a lot of people responded to it, and I doubt that Many feminists could say that what Gillard said about Tony Abbott was wrong or that you could even argue with her attacks on him. However, at the same time, in Parliament that very day, her government voted with Abbott's party to carry out a massive attack on women's rights with the uh, cutting of sole parent pensions, which most sole parents, are, of course, are, are women. So could you explain a little bit about that contradiction in Julie Gillard's politics and the kind of feminism that she stands for? I wouldn't hold Julia Gillard up as a role model for feminism. She is a politician first and foremost. However, what we saw with her speech was a culmination of frustration, I believe, at being treated as a female before a politician. Women are not often in the position where they can talk about the sexism they encounter because if they do that, they are called out for calling the gender card or they're told that they're hysterical. So she's very carefully avoided doing that. But I think that enough was enough. And I don't think it's a coincidence that after Anne Summer's article about how much sexism she actually encounters became quite public, that she finally felt liberated enough to let loose as a human being about all of the sexism she encountered. I guess young women are often told that feminism is no longer necessary because we've got a female Prime Minister, we have a female Governor General, there are a lot of women on boards of, of big companies. People use that as an example that, you know, feminism has won, you know, we've won equality. What's your perspective on, on that? A lot of people are extremely deluded. If you look at the representation of women in the lower houses of Parliament in Australia, it's actually dropped. As far as feminism goes in terms of, you know, being finished and gone, the word post-feminist has been used since 1911. So people are always going to say that it's it's over and gone, but I think that just judging by this month's activities, it's definitely alive and well. On the relevance of feminism, I wanted to ask you about, a lot of young women have been told that there's no need to, to struggle, there's, they've got everything, or at least it's not like the 50s any longer. Um, so what would you say to, to, to young women in particular? Uh, what I would suggest to women is to do a little bit of research on the gender gap of Australia and also compare it to around the world. I mean, the gender pay gap here is around 18%, which is pretty high. They are being paid less and that they will lose over their lifetime around a million dollars. That makes them stop and think. In terms of getting involved, there are actually organizations and groups out there that are doing various kinds of feminist activities, whether it's social or activist, getting out on the street, or doing what our organization does that puts out film documentaries that examine the sexism in modern culture. I think there's so many ways to get involved. You just really need to go on to Google and, and type away. Thanks, Tessa. Green Left TV asks feminist activists across the country what feminism means to them. Equality. Standing together. The liberation of women. Dignity. We need feminism because women continue to face violence in the home, on the street. Empowerment. Community respect and love. Liberation. Liberation. 70% of the 1.3 billion people in the world who are poor are women. Justice. A solidarity. We need to defend the rights that we've won so that we don't lose them again. It's about damn time we got equal pay for the rights and equality of women. Liberation. Respect. Capitalism relies on the unpaid labour of women in the home. Socialism. Because there are people out there who still try and tell me there's things I can and cannot do just because I'm a woman. Freedom of choice. Equality. Equality. Equality for everyone. Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez was re-elected on October 7, winning more than 55% of the vote. He stood on a detailed 39-page program to deepen the popular revolution his government is leading which has already lowered extreme poverty by more than 70% in the country. 
The plan to push for a socialist transition over Chavez's next six year term will be debated in communities and popular organisations across Venezuela over the coming months before it's put to the National Assembly for adoption early next year. For an eyewitness account of what is happening on the ground in Venezuela, we're joined now by Green Left Weekly journalist Pip Hinman, who recently returned from Venezuela after taking part in a solidarity brigade organised by the Australia Venezuela Solidarity Network. Welcome, Pip. Thanks so for having me. What's it like being part of a protest? with three million other socialists. It's a big party. <laughs> it's indescribable. Apart from getting squashed and feeling exhilarated, it's a day-long thing where you actually get to talk to heaps and heaps and heaps of people. The big thing for us brigadistas from all around the world actually, plus many Australians, was uh, the feeling that uh, we were really participating in something special. I don't think I'm ever going to be a part of a three million strong rally again. But people were clearly there because they were showing with their bodies, with their communities, with their families, that they were fully behind Chavez, president and the program that he was putting forward. But I think it would be a mistake to see people as sort of being groupies for Chavez because every person we met, and we met different people and doing different things in the Bolivarian process, were very clear that the change came from themselves, from their communities, from the process. But they had enormous confidence that Chavez was with them. That's what that expression, the three million strong mobilisation just before the elections was showing. The opposition ran a very strong campaign. Can you tell us a bit about the platform that they ran on? Yeah, they ran a sort of Chavez light type campaign. The right-wing media in Venezuela and across the world supported them immensely. Uh, the US was pouring billions of dollars into this media campaign to project Capriles Rodonsky as a sort of Chavez light. Mm. So he ran a sort of duplicitous campaign, a deceitful campaign, whereby he was posing as, I'll keep the social missions, but we'll just remove the excesses towards socialism. You will stop denouncing other countries. It was very deceitful because in actual fact, he wanted to introduce neoliberalism. He was running the campaign for the right wing, for the capitalist class that still exists in, in Venezuela and well, their supporters. There was a leak, wasn't there? They were, they were going to dismantle some of the social programs if they got elected. Yeah, there were several leaks. In fact, the Opposition Alliance, which was uh, acronym for which was MUD, uh, appropriately, started to, to unravel. 55 to 44% was the election result. And this is 14 years after he first got in. I mean, there's no other presidential or prime ministerial contender that, that is, you know, 11 points ahead of the opposition after 14 years. So. That says something about the process and about people supporting Chavez. 14 years of, of this revolution and it's defied a lot of expectations and has certainly raised the ire of the United States. What are some of the, the strengths of the revolution but also some of the, the danger points or the weaknesses which could stop it? Well, the, the, the big strengths are the fact that majority of Venezuelans have been lifted out of poverty now. They have a stake in the future of a new society and a new economy. There's no illiteracy anymore. 50% of the younger population is going to university now. They're churning out masses of doctors. The social and the economic programs that are assisting ordinary folk are massive. People really do feel they have a stake. But beyond that, I, th I suppose, you know, there's a generation of young people that have grown up under Chavez, who've only known Chavez. And it's actually some of those people, ironically, who've benefited from free education, free health care, subsidised food, have voted against him. And I think the challenge for the revolution is to deepen the consciousness of the process, and especially with the younger generation. And unless there's a political process which involves, discusses, debates alternatives, that element is going to stay there. Did you get a chance to, to look at any of these debates or participate in any of those things? Like, what did you do when you were over there? We visited the main university in Caracas the Central University, and we also visited the Bolivarian University. We were guided through both universities by Chavistas, who were telling us about some of the shortcomings. There is a big discussion about pedagogy going on in Venezuela now. How do you best teach people? Mm. And that relates to the whole political process as well. How do people come to understand that, you know, they have to continue to struggle for what is rightfully theirs? There's still a big section of the population that's disengaged, that is not political. Mm. So not pro-Chavez, not anti-Chavez, just not engaged. I think one of the big struggles they're going to face in the next period is to how do you engage that population, that section of the population? Mm. I mean, there's the right that is engaged. They want to get rid of him. They're completely you know, that's their, their mission. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, then there's the Chavistas, which are mainly the, the poor, 
uh, and the more educated of the sort of more middle class. But then there's that section that's not engaged yet. And I think the struggle is to deepen that process. In fact, the next six year plan is to deepen that process to, to try and set up more communes, communal structures, involve more people in all of this. And that will carry forward the revolution. I mean, the next six year plan involves taking big steps towards socialising production. So that will mean more nationalisations. And that will need a consciousness to go with that, mm. uh, to accept that that's, that's the best thing for the economy and for the society. How do you feel coming back to Australia after vis- visiting Venezuela? Because they call their revolution uh, socialism of the 21st century. I mean, are you convinced that socialism, you know, it's viable? It's, it's a realistic alternative? Yeah, more than anything else, it's sort of underscored a commitment that I have to try to build a socialism and talk up socialism. It's certainly not linear, it's certainly not straightforward, and certainly very complicated, but I, it, it, it certainly convinced me that, you know, being determined consciousness, that people are creating something new out of the old, mm. it can be done, it takes a lot of persistence, it takes a lot of conviction, and yes, we can learn the lessons from the past, but this is profoundly democratic. That's the thing that hit me strongly. This is profoundly democratic and it's profoundly coming from the grassroots. That's what struck me most. Okay. Thanks for joining us on Green Left Report, Pip. Thank you. And now we'll hear from Carlos Sands. G'day, I'm Carlos Sands. And welcome to my corner. Well, those crazy Norwegians have been handing out their peace prize again without any obvious regard for involvement in any actual wars. This year, the committee appointed by Norway's parliament have decided to declare the European Union the Nobel Peace Prize winners. Coming so soon after they gave Barack Obama the award back in 2009, I'm beginning to wonder if anyone in Norway even knows where Afghanistan is. Perhaps we should all chip in and see if we can send them an atlas. The majority of EU nations are, of course, also members of NATO, which is the military alliance currently violently occupying Afghanistan. And of course, when they gave the award to Barack Obama, it was at the same time as the US commander in chief was escalating the war by sending thousands more US soldiers to occupy Afghanistan and spreading the conflict into Pakistan. Seriously, if you can give people like this a Nobel Peace Prize, why not just get Alan Jones to chair a Reclaim the Night rally? Or make me the government face of their Drinkwise ad campaigns? The argument of those who support giving this award to the EU say things like, thanks to the existence of the European Union, we've been spared in this century examples of wars like World War I and World War II. Well, first of all, just because there are no wars between European nations doesn't mean there are no wars involving European nations. And believe me, I'm as happy as the next person to see Germany not invade Poland. I suspect the distinction between mass slaughter in Europe and mass slaughter in Central Asia is lost on the victims of NATO's drone strikes. And really, there are very few serious analyses of the causes of World War I and World War II that conclude if only there'd been some sort of near totally bankrupt European union of some sort in which bureaucrats and politicians could meet in say Brussels to decide which of the weaker members to kick the shit out of this week with brutal austerity in order to shift as much wealth as possible from ordinary people to big banks to try and get out of the global economic crisis if only that had existed we could have been spared the terrible conflict of those two world wars and the irony is thanks to the brutal austerity policies of the European Union, we are actually seeing in places like Greece the rise of a neo-Nazi threat. We are seeing the neo-Nazi force, Golden Dawn, polling, thanks to the despair caused by this austerity, polling 14% and organising vicious attacks on immigrants and leftists, often backed by the police force. But don't worry. I'm sure this new breed of vicious fascism being fed by the latest example of collective punishment of an entire nation in a bid to get out of a global depression 
will prove to be a lot less violent than the last time Europe faced such a threat. I'm sure there's no need whatsoever for us to worry. I'm Carlos Sands. And that's my corner. Thanks, Carlo. We'll leave you with a performance by Thousand Eyes from Global Noise in Perth. That's all for the Green Left Report this show. To keep producing media for the 99% we need your support, you can donate to us online at greenleft.org.au, but also be sure to share the show on email, Facebook or Twitter and help build a wider audience for media that's not owned by billionaires. Goodbye. Goodbye. I've seen the power concentrated in the top 1% While well, the other 99% who've got far to left In the dark we've got the reason of what you've got for Touching taxes, profit, expectation, bloody fortune seeking Control the world's governments for making their money The main political parties, man, they've taken their funding But they say they'll cut their funding if their orders ain't met The black male politicians are all caught in their neck and they get the blame and the regime gets a change With a new puppet's pressure face Everything gets left in place, it ever stays Banks, well they're too big to fail And even though they cause that GFC, they're too big to jail Package debt into loans so they can bid against them During the recession, they're still making profits What they didn't mention, demand at the taxpayers Bail them out billions, which they never even needed So I say we rebuild this OCC, UPY, Occupy, Occupy O-C-C-U-P-Y Occupy, Occupy One last time O-C-C-U-P-Y Occupy, Occupy Thank you, Occupy <laughs>